thanks for coming, everyone. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Patrick Bill, Assistant Director at the Center for Digital Strategy. I want to welcome you to the first Great Technology Effects Series talk of the year. Um, this year, we've decided to, to, to focus, um, a few years ago, we focused on big data as one of our, as our theme for the year. We really decided to go back to that theme this year and look a little bit deeper. Da the, the use of data has really changed within organizations um, and companies to the point where the, they're really using data more effectively, driving decisions, driving digital transformation, um, using, starting to see a lot more AI and machine learning as well embedded into those decisions where you know, human interaction is sometimes removed from that equation altogether at times. Um, so we're really excited for the year. We've got a really full year. Check out our, the website to sign up for future events. We've got one more talk, on, another talk on Friday with the folks in HubSpot. Um, but we are really excited for today. So today we're lucky to have the CEO of Rokana, Omar Triman, here to join us to talk a little bit about his company, a little bit about what they're doing from a digital transformation, talk a lot about data. Um, and without further ado, I will turn it over. Welcome, Omar. Thank you. Uh, so just quick background uh, to give you a little context uh, as I, I talk about uh, what I've been focusing on in, in Rokana. Um, so I uh, did my undergrad in computer engineering, kind of jumped into the startup world. Uh, most of you, I don't know, kind of kind of gauge around the room. I started a company in 2000. You guys see who laughs. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the first internet wave basically exploded that year. Uh, that company didn't really go anywhere, um, but have been working on um, startups, uh, sort of one after the other. Sometimes joining early, sometimes founding them. Um, got into data. Uh, let's see, ten, a little over ten years ago, at um, a company uh, called Vertica. Uh, this was founded by a guy named Mike Stonebreaker. Uh, Mike Stonebreaker is known as the godfather of databases. So if you use a database system, it's largely based on, uh, on Mike's work. And so I got a chance to work with him. Realized at that point I was uh, a really shitty product engineer. I got pulled aside, like stop writing code. Uh, but turns out I could help people understand what to do with a product. And so that's where I started working more with customers and how to actually apply different technologies. You know, at the time we were throwing parties when we could analyze a terabyte of data. Like that was a huge deal uh, on, uh, you know, on a handful of machines. And within a few years, started hearing about uh, something that is uh, probably more well known now, a technology called Hadoop. Um, and a company that um, just recently went public this year that was commercializing that uh, called Cloudera. Uh, and so I had a chance to be uh, the first VP at Cloudera, built out the entire field technical team, worked with all their large customers on figuring out what to do with all this data and what kind of problems uh, they could solve, and started noticing uh, other interesting problems that I'm not going to give away just yet, but the focus of what uh, I wanted to spend some time talking to you about and hearing some of your questions uh, is what happens in a world where it is basically free to collect and analyze data, which was not the case, you know, five, ten years ago. Um, so that's a bit about me. Just kind of curious, uh, how many, how many sort of first year, second year in the room? How many first years? Sort of Cool, and second, people have had a uh, summer. Good. Um, how many people have worked in tech, your own definition of it? Also fantastic. How many people use tech? That should be all hands. And at work, how many people think of their job or whatever recent job they've had as involving using technology? Bless you. Uh, cool, okay. Um, I want to throw one question out there, actually a few questions out there, but um, so this is the Center for Digital Strategies. Anyone have a thought on what digital means? This is going to be a very interesting day. Cool. <laughs> um, so um, let me ground this a little more. Everyone's familiar with stock market, right? NYSE, NASDAQ, CME. Okay. Um, anyone not familiar? Should I do a brief? Primer, right? If you have, uh, you know, equity in a company, you want to buy or sell it. There's a market that lets you buy or sell it and helps you determine the price. Um, anyone know how the stock market 
works. Has anyone actually had experience kind of digging in or working for any of the markets? Um, so, uh, right, the, yeah? Yeah. That's perfectly it, right? It's, it's two sides of, of a market. Um, there's generally, just to elaborate a little bit on that, there's generally sort of an, a, an order book, right? So a bunch of people will bid and a bunch of people will kind of say, give their asking price. And the market's job is to try and find sort of the price at which they actually uh, uh, transact, right? Um, and this happens in uh, microseconds. It happens, you know, millions or billions of times. Uh, in any given minute. Um, does anyone know how the market itself, so like Nisey the company, uh, makes money? Yeah. Brokers pay a fee to be, have access to the market in exchange. Exactly. They get paid, well, they get paid on access, they get paid on listing, but very specifically, they get paid on transactions. So for you to buy or sell, there's some fee involved there. And this creates um, a very interesting scenario. Um, does anyone know sort of a comparable business where they're making money based on not the value of what's being transferred or the pure dollars, but just being there to facilitate the transaction? Yeah. Um, yeah. So eBay? All right, <laughs> is a great example. Um, so if you think about the business incentives, if you're sitting in the boardroom, right, at a company that uh, basically makes money off uh, 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 the volume of transactions for arbitrary instruments, right? In this case, you know, how many shares exist in the world? It's kind of an arbitrary number to some extent, right? Um, your incentive and how you run that business is based on how do I make sure there's volume, right? I don't care if it goes up, I don't care if it goes down, anything that drives people to trade. And so what that's done is it's created um, this interesting phenomenon in company that's known as a liquidity provider, right? So volume, right? The ability to trade is liquidity, right, in an asset. So these liquidity providers are companies that get paid to trade. So if I want to go to the market and buy stock or sell stock and no one is willing to match that price, right? Not only am I unhappy, but Nazi doesn't make any money, right? If there's someone else on the other side of the transaction, they make money, right? If the volatility is up and down and people are scared, like, you know what, I'm either gonna cash out, I'm just gonna sit on cash, I'm gonna sit in safe instruments, or I'm playing the long game, like, I don't know what it's gonna do this year, I'm gonna put in money that I don't care about for the next five years, Nazi doesn't make money. Right? They make money when the markets are smooth, they make markets when the dips are small and graduated, right? They make money when there's someone else on the other side of the transaction. So now, you know, I put you in the boardroom at NYSE, you found a partner, you found another company to help you ensure that there is volume, right? Now put yourself in the executive room of a liquidity provider. How do you take an incentive from the market and figure out how to always be available on the other side of a trade? Right, and people play the market for generations and lose money, right? Most money managers lose money. How do you establish that kind of company? Any thoughts? Yeah. You go on both sides of the trade. They can go on both sides. But can you just like put yourself on both sides of the same trade? Uh, you can't, yeah, you don't get paid for that. I mean, you'd pay, yeah, you'd lose money. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the strategies, right, just to simplify this, is be out of the market at the end of every day. Right, because your job is not to make money on the market, that's a bonus. Your job is just to be there to take trades. Don't lose money, and don't lose money on the value of the stock that you're trading, and you will make money. Yeah. Coming to that point, you could just take like, if, if, you're, if you're buying, you could just short, you could just use 
derivatives like a swap or something, mm -hmm. and just take the opposite position so you're always flat on your risk? As long as you time, yeah. As long as you time it. Yeah. Just hedge it out. Other thoughts? So, yeah. Do you also just buy and trade really fast? Definitely. That's very important. You don't want to get stuck okay. holding something and then unwinding it. So a few of these companies exist. It's not huge, not nearly as large as hedge funds or, right, or banks or brokers. Um, and what they do is they take that full order book. They take not just every trade or every value. They get from the market every potential bid and ask that anyone has ever tried to put in, including the fake ones. A lot of people put in fake, fake bids and asks and never actually consummate the transaction just to kind of test the volume or test the market. Um, they take all of it. You talk about big data, right? hundreds of terabytes, if not petabytes a day of information across all the markets. They look across different markets, right? So they're looking at potentially, maybe I'll lose a little money on certain assets in NYSE, but that information helps me trade on CME, right? Because they look at the dependency graph in any given collection of assets, right? Um, maybe you are uh, losing money on the one hand with, you know, farming equipment, but making money on the commodities exchange for corn, right? I mean, I, I'm just, that is not a well-manufactured example, but right. So that, that kind of logic. And so the core of what's happening is they're basically hiring scientists, right? We used to be physicists. Now we have a name for them, data scientists, who are looking at volumes of data well, not physically looking at them, but building algorithms to analyze on an ongoing basis volumes of data and creating thousands of these market trading strategies that they can put into play at any given point in time to ensure that at best they're not you know, losing money, they break even so that the company makes money. And ideally, there's some gravy on top, they're actually making money on top of this. I'm going to switch tracks for just one second. I'll, I'll connect the dots here. Um, first of all, does that make sense? Any questions about that? Most people don't even know that these exist. In fact, the crash in, was it 07, 08, was uh, significantly less severe than it would otherwise have been because of liquidity providers. And you just watch the graph during the day uh, during trading. Uh, right, because the markets don't want to stop trading, because then they're just they're literally losing money if there's no trading going on. Um, do you ever feel like uh, an advertisement's following you around the internet? Sorry, is there a question? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, that uh, uh, that is not an accident. So. Um, the way advertising works on the internet is uh, content publishers will usually uh, allocate portions of their space to um, advertising uh, exchanges uh, or ad platforms who then go and sell that to, usually there's, there's you know, some three to five levels deep, eventually gets to marketing firm, eventually gets to dollars allocated from you know, someone who's actually advertising. Um, so take, you know, cars, for example, your Audi, you're allocating a certain percentage of your budget to digital advertising. There's a firm responsible for that. They talk to DoubleClick and Facebook and write all the exchanges. Um, and then uh, part of the strategy that they use is this, uh, a concept called retargeting, where if you have ever expressed any interest in, uh, you know, an, an Audi either by going to the site watching a Facebook video, right, a hovering momentarily, like any indication that there's potential interest, there's some cookie that identifies you with that, um, sort of associates that with you. And then as literally in the seconds it takes to load a web page, there is a complex bidding process happening as to who is willing to pay more for what advertisement on that spot given whatever information they can gather about you, right? So looking at, you know, all the cookies on your machine, some people have access to some, some people have access to more, how much is it worth for me to advertise 
there. And there's also perverse incentives here, right? Because the person who's actually doing the bidding wants to spend the advertiser's money. They don't actually care about, they don't get paid by conversion necessarily, right? They get paid by click-through um, uh, and sometimes just by, by milling views. The algorithms, and this is probably not surprising now since I just mentioned both these, right? The algorithms that help you figure out how to be in the opposite side of every trade um, have the same roots, the same concepts as the algorithms that are used for uh, advertising, right, and for online advertising. Because right? at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're getting as much information as you can, taking an algorithm that you've developed, some model, right? Uh, Patrick mentioned machine learning and AI. Ultimately, it's some mathematical formula, evaluating one against the other and coming up with an answer, do I bid, do I not bid, and how much? So um, a few things. Um, let me tie this back, and then and I'll jump ahead a little more into uh, digital. So uh, one of the things that we realized, the, the company that I run today, Rokana, one of the things we realized at Cloudera is that the capability to take that volume of information, build algorithms, and then use them to run revenue generating business where if the algorithms fail or the systems that run the algorithms fail businesses lose money right is much harder than what most companies are established to do today um, and this applies operationally very apropos to recent events this applies from a security perspective mm -hmm. right Creating systems that use data that have potentially sensitive, valuable information and making sure they're up and running and secure is a really, really, really hard problem. Um, the joke I like to make is that at Google, they hire PhDs in computer science and they give them pagers, right? They say, go make sure that Gmail works, right? Um, if you uh, have a PhD and you go work at JP Morgan, right, and you're living in Manhattan, you're not carrying a pager around, right? You're building currency trading algorithms, right? You're working on the backend platform for investment banking. The people at JP Morgan who carry the pagers, they live in Ohio on a 10,000 person campus. They don't have PhDs, right? They rely heavily on outside vendors. Um, they have established the company around uh, very vertically integrated application stacks where I need to build an application that supports a trader or a broker who's going to be on the phone where if the system has a glitch they can write it down on a piece of paper or they can call someone in back-end IT right and uh, that can take minutes and we're talking about microseconds orders a magnitude difference in the responsibility, responsibility level of the, of the operator. Um, and so what we realize is two things. One, uh, those people need new software. They need new tools. Uh, we don't have enough smart people in the world to put into every single seat, right, staring at a bunch of screens. Has anyone been to the, um, uh, the knock at Akamai in Kendall Square? Um, so you walk in and there's like this glass room and these like, thousands of monitors with all like these spinning globes and lights flashing and so forth, right? That's a very fancy knock. Most of them are really boring. Um, but, uh, but that's the idea, right? Someone's sitting there you know, making sure that the systems are operating. Uh, the software that has been used over the past few decades has been built around the concept that systems are not connected. That, um, right, so you don't have, you know, mobile check deposit you go and talk to a teller and you give them a check and they have a paper trail and it can you know, be reconciled in a week, right? Rather than instantly making your cash available to you. And so the difference in supporting those systems is uh, dramatic in terms of the workload required. Um, that was one, there's kind of this new need. The second is that, by the way, the same algorithms that are used to solve for high frequency trading and liquidity providers, the same algorithms that can be developed to figure out, should I uh, you know, bid on a particular ad space to, to sell a, a car ad, um, those are actually applicable to running the systems. Right? At the end of the day, 
uh, the market is, in essence, a time series system. Anyone know what, when I talk about time series, does that make sense? Uh, it's events with timestamps, right? Fancy way of saying that. So uh, advertising is the same way. It's all, it's all time series, right? You load a page, there's a timestamp behind it and a trail of your activity that's all timestamped. The underlying machines, every single computer in this room, every digital device has events. Sometimes those events are recorded by the software developer. I want to make a note that something happened, good or bad, in the system, and it has a timestamp. And those are usually referred to as log files, right? You're kind of logging, bless you, logging that something happened. Um, and the others are basic metrics. I just want to check the value, check the quality of something. Um, and those also have timestamps. This is the value of the amount of memory used by my computer at this point in time, and it goes up or it goes down, and you can build trends around it. Um, so what we figured out is the same techniques that we had been using to you know, help people build better mortgage models, right? Um, we could actually apply those to helping people operate the underlying infrastructure. Right? Um, and in essence, what it becomes is, uh, has anyone uh, had a chance to work with any kind of like business warehouse or just financial analytics, things like Teradata, Oracle, or uh, Tableau is kind of probably the interface, right? It's Excel, but much larger. Um, we think of that in essence as a warehouse for the business, right? So you can do an assessment of the cash flow and you can build your PL and balance sheet and you can send reports to your suppliers, uh, you can bill. Um, that same warehouse concept applied to operations, applied to IT. And so um, if I'm a retailer, right, and I have a physical store, and the cash register doesn't work, I can't make any money, right? Now, I probably can. I can take orders on paper and so forth. But ultimately, if you have thousands of stores and you have a pervasive bug or someone's hacking you or there's an operational outage, you want IT figuring that out. And you want them figuring it out sooner rather than later, ideally they should identify the problem as it's emerging rather than when someone in the store calls them up and says, you know, I can't check out. And so what our software does is basically collects all that information, applies uh, sort of uh, machine learning models to that, it sort of identifies what kind of looks normal, what do you not have to worry about, um, what is trending abnormal, what do you potentially have to worry about, how are systems connected, um, and I don't, if we have time, I can get a little bit into like cloud and stuff. We'll see. Um, but uh, the connectivity between systems has gotten orders of magnitude more complex than just a few years ago before cloud technologies uh, came about. Um, so how are things are, are connected in a given point in time? And then, you know, ideally, what should you be focusing on? What, what should you actually spend your precious time on to try and, uh, and address and resolve? I'm going to go one step further, but does that... Make sense to folks? Any questions about operations? IT operations, it's entirely unsexy. It's like the most boring <laughs> thing, right? It's like, you know, people are responsible for like fixing the desk and vacuuming. Like that's, that's kind of the concept behind it. In fact, I'd say part of the hardest thing in helping people understand the value of this is most people think of IT as the people who like fix my email or, you know, the fax machine when it breaks, right? Um, but it actually is a, it becoming a, a very important, um, and you'll hear, I think, from the CIOs that, that come in how important influential IT is becoming. Um, so here's an interesting side effect, right? So I mentioned retail very specifically. Retailers are getting their ass kicked by Amazon, right, who does understand the value of digital, is primarily digital, right? They can uh, support uh, you know, shopping carts that don't crash when there's high volumes, except just incidentally when the classic Nest came out, they did crash because of the volume for that. But in general, right, uh, Black Friday, there's no problem, right? Um, Cyber Monday, they handle those, those volumes fine. Um, and they're constantly adapting the business to it, right? So part of the reason that Amazon has an advantage is when you go to Amazon, I go to Amazon, we could see diff different prices. For the, same, for the same product, you can't do that in a physical store. Now, a stepping stone to that is if you are used to, you know, the store is closing the day, 
reporting to their sort of regional office, the regional office rolling up their region at the end of every week. At the end of every month, someone funnels data into a Teradata system. They run some report and like, oh, that's how much money we made last month. And then at the end of the quarter, they report it out to the street and a little bit of financial engineering and ta-da, the stock price is up, right? Um, if you look at a world in which the way IT operates is to collect every millisecond, every bit of event uh, information that's happening across all the systems, and those systems are supporting a largely digital business. You're not doing transactions on paper. You can actually capture the full trail record, right? You can, in theory, if you're monitoring every point of sale system across every single store, you could know up to date in real time the cash balance of the company. You could know what's selling and what isn't. You could identify which cash register is more productive today than it was yesterday. You could manage employees who have recently been hired who seem to be doing greater volume. You could influence your entire supply chain, right, and make Walmart supply chain analysis look antiquated because you know what people are buying as they're buying it. And so the opportunity here is to take the same concepts of how do I build algorithms on top of volumes of data and make microsecond decisions in a world where maybe it's not too large a cognitive leap right, in the markets or in internet advertising and start applying it to everything. Right? The amount of analysis that goes into FedEx routes to make sure that they only make right turns, right? And now put ways on top of it. And it's not a one-off analysis. It's continuously optimizing based on the happenstance of packages, right, and the timing of lights and where there's been an accident, the specifics of the route. Right. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Th that happens really quickly. So, you know, as we look at the growth of machine learning in particular, it seems like that's necessary to be able to support this, right? Because humans can't, can't in, it, there's, when you're talking about milliseconds, there just can't be a, a point at which a human logically can get into that in the middle of that in the moment. Correct. So um, differentiate, so, so if you look at the way a stack gets built in digital, um, you have basic data collection, which is you lay out and ensure that you have reliable um, access to detailed information. And reliable is key. Um, there's a retail a CPG company that had a bunch of um, sort of direct to consumer devices and uh, realized that they were not getting reliable feeds, which means the feed itself is useless. If I have uh, a sampling of data, and I extrapolate from that, I'm almost always going to be wrong unless it just doesn't change, right? So anything that's reasonably changing, if you don't have full fidelity data, right, samples have become useless very quickly. Um, and so there is, it's better to just not look at it, <laughs> right? Um, and figure out when they can turn that back on. So reliable collection of data, right, bottom of the stack. Um, there's an analysis phase where you're saying, okay, what kinds of models, um, and remember model is just, uh, you know, or, or an arithmetic formula, it's just an algorithm. Um, what kinds of models uh, are able to analyze or ideally predict uh, the trend of a particular set of data, whether it's the value of a stock, the level of uh, activity volume, the time it takes to go from point A to point B and pick up a box and drop it off. Um, there's the execute, and then you build sort of portfolio of these because they're, they're varying, they're not, there's not one model to, to rule them all. There's the execution of those models, which ones are in play at a given point in time. And as the mo models execute to your point, they execute in milliseconds, right? So they're making decisions. But the decision on which model to use today has still been human driven or required human oversight. Um, Google is starting to discover that we can probably automate that better than humans. Humans, uh, Google has, has come up with a, certain, a few scenarios where um, machine learning models are building better models than their data scientists. Right. Um, so, but it, like there's some, right, there's some business level 
Well, in theory, there is some business level where uh, you know, someone looks at the analysis of the data, the, capa the digital capabilities of the company, and says, go that way, right? Um, the, uh, the funny analogy is if you looked at like Uber or Lyft, right? Um, it, the people who work for those companies, the actual drivers, right? They don't really have to think very much, right, in sort of the day to day course, right? There's something that tells them where the rides are, it tells them where to wait. Right? They kind of optimize by machine their entire job. Until we have self-driving cars, we need drivers. Once we have self-driving cars, like the algorithms to tell the cars everything to do, those already exist. Uh, so I, you know, that will eat its way up the management chain. Uh, you know, don't get a job in middle management. That's going to get automated. <laughs> <laughs> HR, yeah. Uh, I have a question um, regarding, like, isn't there like, a portion of this that's just like data massaging? Because if data is data sources all siloed. So I saw this in like the operations world where you have your CRM, your ERP, your financial systems, and to kind of do kind of any of analysis, you need to be able to draw, connect the dots. I mean, is that automated or like how do you deal with that? Data condition? massaging, data um, uh, correlation um, is extremely difficult. It is a thousand times more difficult for companies that didn't go into it thinking that that was a problem. Um, it is, largely human driven. A lot of data scientists will describe themselves as data janitors, like their job is to clean data. Um, there's a great story um, a guy I worked with who used to be at uh, Google and worked on some of their um, uh, prediction, right? So you type in uh, Google search and it says, did you mean this other thing, right? Um, talked about the algorithm for that, right? And you would think um, sort of intuitively as a human about how do you solve that problem? Well, I build a dictionary of all the terms and then I permute all the terms and then I do a lookup into the permutations. So no, you think about it the other way around, right? You have a billion people searching every second. You look for web sessions, time series, where someone types in a word, doesn't click on the results, changes the spelling, and then clicks on a result. And you count the number of times that happens, right? It is a sum, that's it. That's the algorithm, right? That's the model. It's the orienting the data in a way that the sum is trivial that allows them to, to do that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. There are some attempts, uh, talking to Andy earlier. So uh, Takalam Andy Palmer has a company called Tamer, T-A-M-R. And part of their innovation, he founded it with Mike Stonebreaker, um, is to apply uh, machine learning algorithms to continuously learn how to do that mapping. So one of the solutions that um, they have talked about um, that they have in market is taking um, sort of parallel supply chains in large companies, uh, sort of just sourcing vendor parts that have sort of different names, different descriptions, different prices, uh, and just combining those databases and figuring out the right mapping when you have like a million parts. Um, and then helping them just get better prices and, and better efficiency in the, in the supply chain. Um, so yeah, data cleansing is a big part of that. Um, the approach that we've taken at Rokana, because the domain is very specific, we know that a Cisco router is a Cisco router, that an EMC storage array is an EMC storage array. We, we know a lot more about the domain um, that uh, we can bake in a lot of sort of the data cleansing side of it. There's also things that you can learn about data in time series that doesn't require knowing anything deep about the event. So if I have an event that comes from a particular server and I have an event that comes from a particular network and I see that they seem to be correlated or they, you know, the host seems to use the network because they're on the same subnet and then one volume spikes and one volume drops, right? So the retries on the host and networking spike and the port activity on the switch drops. Okay, right? That's a pretty easy to diagnose at that point. And I don't care if the data is messy just because I looked at, I basically just looked at data volume at that point. So there's this, yes, and within the domain, it gets, it gets easier. Um, the other thing worth mentioning this, so uh, interesting, areas where this is starting to really pervade sort of real life <laughs> day to day. Um, and there's a recent 
NPR article on this as well uh, in, uh, in radiology specifically, but if you look at personalized medicine in general, um, there's only so much that a human can gather data and do an analysis without being highly biased. But a machine, you know, you know the bias is going into the machine because they're spelled out in the spreadsheet. Um, so a machine can do analysis, you know, image analysis on, say, um, you know, a, a radiological image and come to more accurate conclusions. Um, and it doesn't need to fix the data. It just needs to be trained on the data source. So you give it enough training data set and the algorithm is making up for errors in it. Um, to give you a counter example to that, uh, there was a machine vision presentation a few months ago around uh, self-driving cars and just sort of vision and navigation. And they basically showed uh, what the machine vision wa uh, system was detecting. And it was interesting in the video, it was not showing the uh, yellow lines in the middle of the road, right? It automatically identified street signs and trees and person and buildings and other cars, but it didn't know yellow lines. And the reason is it just wasn't tagged in the training set. No one taught it, right, what a yellow line was, and so it had no idea, it didn't even look for it. But everything else could be messy, right? Everything else was, it was image data, and it didn't care how cloudy it was, if it was daytime or nighttime, because it had infrared. Um, so yes, but even that is for, the dom for a very domain specific. Uh, you mentioned uh, personalized medicine and how the machines and tell them to use data to uh, guide uh, treatments. I'm trying to understand where would the differentiation lie for different companies if every company is using the data to uh, using uh, data algorithms to uh, guide decisions. So, in a world where everyone, you know, anyone who hasn't adapted is dead, uh, right? All the companies operate like Google. Um, they all collect data, use data, build models. Um, the best we can tell so far is that more data beats better algorithms. And if you look at this pessimistically, macroeconomically, um, it almost this innovation creates a bias towards monopolies. People who have access to the most data have an unfair advantage against everyone else. Data creates a moat that no one can beat. Um, and if that is true, then realistically, probably regulation is the only way to, um, to solve that. Because otherwise, you end up with you know, three to five companies in every market, and that's it. And you can't, no one can ever disrupt anything, um, unless it's a brand new market. But that's a good, yeah, scary world to think about. And yeah, I'm curious if folks just kind of thinking back, especially people who said they don't really use tech as much at work, thought about where the gaps are, where the competition is, um, any ideas about domains where access to data. Let me tell you another story while you're noodling on that. I talked to um, uh, business development uh, VP at a company that manufactured point of sale systems. Like so you go and you stick your card in or whatever. And the time I was talking to them about uh, recommendations. How do you take the people also bought stuff that you get on Amazon and apply it to the checkout counter, right? And he looked at me, he's like, but there's so little room on the display, right? That was his answer. We could never do that. Because how do you recommend something on like a two line LCD display? I was like, have you ever heard of Square? Like, point of sale systems are iPads, right? You know, flip it over, sign your name, put in a tip. Oh, and by the way, do you want one of these? Click to add a gift card, right? Even Walgreens has like the ability to donate, right, as you're checking out. And so, like, that world of interactivity for a company, this is a very large company that sells a lot of point of sale systems and makes a ton of money overcharging people for credit cards, right? Uh, for taking credit cards, um, is going to be entirely disrupted by someone who said, oh yeah, just iPads are free, right? Just use those, right? And it opens up the entire world of access to that consumer interaction. And it makes it a lot more predictable, a lot more scripted. In the Uber model, you don't have to train you know, the, uh, the cashier the way you do in a normal retail scenario because you scan the items and it just tells you these are the questions to like a call center. This is what you should ask. This is today's upsell, you know, script, right? This is what you should do if a customer wants to return something. Just put it all there in front of them and your training costs drop. And by the way, you can then measure their productivity. 
Do I hire this person? Do I fire this person? If it's seasonal, do I bring them back next year? Try tracking all those metrics because you see when they touch and interact. Yeah. How do you see this overlapping with the other side of humans? Like we don't like being tracked by the ads. And as we become, in theory, maybe like play that out, we become more and more aware of how much is being automated and monitored. Um, what do you think like, the pushback is going to be or how will that integrate? Say sort of human psychology or the, um, yeah, how, how, how does society re revolt against? Well, I don't think it's like a revolt. I don't think we have to take it to that, but even just the, just the pushback and ads, the pushback of going to the cart or seeing that like, you're not feeling like we, I'm not having a human interaction because I can tell that the script is being read. Like the call center experience yeah. isn't a good customer experience typically when you have these scripts. So when it becomes clearly the algorithm is clearly a script or like can we get the algorithm to not be or how do you create that human authenticity within these experiences? Yeah, how's, how's the interaction? It's not a robot interaction. And though we were just talking about how humans have robot robotic like policy based interactions um, this is a bit of the futurist in me I think machines will be better at it because I as a human only have so many waking cycles a day to think about the various scenarios and um, I can only create you know so much of a decision tree for people who I can hire and train you know in a day to give them a script if it's a chatbot, right, and there's no human at the other end of it, that chatbot has infinite memory. It could potentially know and recall instantly every single detail about every interaction that I've had. All right, so I'm calling to, because I'm canceling my, my cable service, you know, the chatbot could chime in with, oh yeah, did you have, you know, I noticed here in our logs that, and it has to explain why it's super creepy, though I think the next generation <laughs> assumes they're being watched all the time so um, but like I noticed here that you are a big fan of whatever Game of Thrones like are you sure you want to cancel we'll give you this incentive in order to actually stay and then you could you know finish binge watching next week or something like that so I think with the creepiness factor right but they get um, they get better at it and less robotic I think the call centers we have today are robotic even though it's humans who are technically having the, the conversation um, so, to bring up like the chat bot example, um, I understand like the ability if you have like massive amounts of data and like uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of conversations daily, you're able to like build an algorithm on that. But when you have like the majority of businesses in the U.S. that are just like SMBs and that maybe have like a couple conversations or a dozen conversations a day, do you think those businesses are going to be able to like? capitalize on these sort of trends if they don't have that volume of data? Uh, not directly. I think they'll have to find vendors who aggregate data. Um, the analogy is if I'm an SMB and I want to run a, mark a local marketing campaign, right? I want to put an ad in news news and put out flyers. Uh, you know, I go to Axiom. I tell them my parameters. They have data on every human on earth, right? And they provide me with a list, right? Um, I think the same thing happens, but it's less manual. So I, as an SMB, look to my vendors and say, how much of the service that you're providing to me is driven by the collective knowledge of data that helps me move my business forward? And if you, as a vendor, don't have access to that information and you don't have sophisticated algorithms in my, you know, whatever capabilities you're providing me, um, I'm going to move to a vendor that does. You're a shipping, local shipping service. You don't have ways. I'm going to go to one that does and can give me a better rate and more reliable delivery. Um, but I think the businesses themselves are, are probably not going to be. Like, there's just not enough. It's not enough data. Yeah. I think the mid-market's an interesting question because the mid-market right, um, also doesn't have enough data, isn't sufficiently sophisticated in terms of hiring. Right, uh, They can't hire people who are, who are smart enough even if they had access or bought the data. Um, they probably don't have enough leverage against vendors to get uh, better pricing than maybe, you know, maybe slightly better the SMB, but they're not enterprise scale. So they can't compete on, um, you know, on margins necessarily. So where does that leave them, right? Someone who is national could beat a medium-sized business locally with a little bit of branding, 
right, to make them look local. Um, maybe they can't offer the uniqueness of an SMB because there's a quality there and the SMB has access to maybe compar sufficiently comparable vendors and it's not an interesting enough niche. But um, there's a potential argument that in a data powered economy, uh, you, you have no mid-market, right? Going back to the monopolies. Right? You have small companies and large companies and no one else. I think we're going to see the emergence of new aggregators in different domains. So there's two sides to the race, um, and you see it playing out in things like uh, Amazon buying Whole Foods, right? So a retailer wants to get into groceries. The race is can um, uh, Tesco, right, uh, figure out data faster than Amazon can figure out how to buy Whole Foods and use data. So there's a domain moat and access to data, and then there's a knowledge moat. Um, and you're going to see the race in self-driving cars, right? Why are car makers today investing in self-driving cars when it's far from a given that it's going to be allowed from a regulatory perspective, the people who like to drive are going to want to buy self-driving cars, right? We're, we're, we've got a long ramp to get there, but they've they're familiar enough with how these markets develop that if they're not making the investments now, right, whoever is is gonna is gonna win. So I think each you know each market's gonna play out differently. Um, if you look at, for example, like agriculture and farming, uh, John Deere and Caterpillar have known this for years, and they uh, you know effectively lease you the equipment and then make you pay a subscription to the algorithms based on the data that you're collecting for them, right? Uh, right, and they have monopolies, so they can do that. Um, and no one else can break into that unless it's massively disruptive. And even then, who knows? But I think it's going to be harder to break into markets. I think that, um, uh, you know, you've, you've looked at the innovator's dilemma as the way that you get into a market, and that may not be as simple anymore. As these companies get bigger and aggregate more and more data, isn't there an increased carrying risk? Uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, I mean, Equifax is all over the news, and, and they're getting hip, just destroyed right now. How, how do those these companies you know, balance that, and is that something that actually limit their growth? Most of the yeah, most of the from a cybersecurity perspective, most of the companies that understand this well have taken better better precautions. Than, <laughs> I'm not going to comment too much on Equifax. Um, yeah, they're they're managed better. I mean. There's an inherent risk in, in cybersecurity, and you need everything from, uh, you know, just good perimeter controls. You need internal assessment and controls. You need, uh, you know, white hack hacking. You need a stellar team. You need to catch things and kind of nip them in the bud before they evolve. And if you don't, you end up with someone running away with your entire data asset. So I think there's a risk. It's a risk that the companies who are good at it uh, understand. Um, and can manage against and everyone else. Just like operationally, most people are in the Stone Age. I think security-wise, it's kind of scary. Like most of the companies that have your personal information are, are just completely oblivious to security risk. And so that's the other side of the coin. All the information leaks anyways, and then who cares? <laughs> I mean, at this, at this point, right, if you look at the, at the Equifax breach, like, you know, someone has data on pretty much the entire credit-holding U.S. population. What else is there to breach? <laughs> um, you know, you move to a mode, it, let's take the Equifax case, you move to a mode where by default, you know, it's two or three factor authentication to get credit. I can't just go and apply for credit. I've got to go authenticate with the credit firms, prove that I'm myself, open the, you know, freeze for 24 hours, then go to the person I'm applying, right? So you just have this much more convoluted process. It's like getting a mortgage today versus 10 years ago uh, or 12 years ago. Uh, loop in back and then. It's, could we per, couldn't we apply the same predictive algorithms 
to the habits of hackers to protect us from the hackers, yes. either on a personal level or a company? Does that happen? Is that happening? Yeah, there's sure there now a few hundred companies tackling every aspect of cybersecurity. So there's specialized companies that are looking for user behavior, so they try to figure out insider threat. Uh, whether it's an individual or simply someone who has access to your username internally, or you do, you know, is someone in HR logging into finance, right? So, H like HR is a great example of sort of a cybersecurity, like just glaring honeypot. Like this is a this is a part of an organization that gets paid to open attachments, right, on Windows machines, right? It just like, and right, so if HR has access to finance systems, um, you know, I've heard uh, great stories about white hack hackers where. Um, they'll infect a network printer and ship it and just hope that someone plugs it in. Like, hey, free printer, right? Um, so there, there's, you know, there's uh, companies that look for sort of the insider threat. Uh, they look for behaviors and systems. They look for behaviors and user patterns. There's companies that do outsider uh, threat. So they look for who's trying to access your network. Um, there's a company that infiltrates the botnets and figures out where they're planning to attack and what the attack profile is going to look like and sends you an advance notice. It doesn't stop it. It just sends you advance notice to, to prevent it. So there's lots of companies trying to figure that out. And I think speculation is that over the next five years, there'll be a lot of consolidation. You'll have you know new versions of RSA, um, but sort of modernized. So as you said, like, data is, going to be the, is the key asset as of today. And there is no way people are going to share data across companies because that's their main asset. And uh, even though people are getting into uh, autonomous vehicles or anything to gather data, there is no way a person, any company, one company will have your complete data about your person. Even if in terms of uh, artificial voice assi assistance, Alexa is not going to capture the entire market. Even if it captures the entire market, you still need data from social network or your re online retail purchase. So is this idea of uh, you know, com uh, completely customized services and products for you based on completely understanding your data, a pipe dream, because I will never have complete data about a person. I think probably ultimate, yeah, ultimate understanding of everything about you is probably a pipe dream, but I think the pockets that are sufficiently seamless and integrate at the, at the seams. So like um, Facebook developed this enrichment system that basically hashes information. So hash is sort of a, uh, uh, one-way cryptographic function where you have unique but non-readable representations of the data, sufficiently, not perfectly unique, but like sufficiently uh, so to say whether you actually know the original data or not. And so they'll hash information about you. They'll share the hashes, which tells you nothing, unless you also hashed your data and had a match. And so two sides can both hash their data sets and say, oh, we have matches. What's the exchange of dollars? that allow us to exchange data and what's the incentive there. And so you can do sort of data exchanges in that way. And so I suspect that at the seams that will happen and then everyone's gonna kind of build their data moats, uh, if you will. It's tender for data. Yeah. <laughs> there is a startup There's in that pitch. Right you, can, you can get seed funding with just, you walk in and say it's tender for data and then you pass the hat around. <laughs> and the angel network throws money. <laughs> I had a question kind of going back to what you were talking about like 10, 15 minutes ago about algorithms being able to you know, essentially write like a macro algorithm, whatever you want to call it, that would choose the best algorithm, right? And I guess my question is looking out over the next 10, 15 years, I feel like, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, that, that seems like a, a relatively easy problem to solve, right? I mean, in some sense where you have that with like gradient descent or whatever, optimization model you want to use. So is it, would not be true that the harder problem is for humans to figure out what metrics actually matter, right? So it's like for example, to, with the car driving the right turn stuff, we could just tell, we could tell the AI, well, just optimize for the shortest route, or the shortest time there, and then I can just go do that. Um, and that's pretty easy, but then with humans, Ceteris Paribus, for example, Ceteris Paribus, they'd want to be driving on an open road more than they'd want to be seeing traffic, right? So maybe tell the algorithm, well, optimize for shortest time, but also optimize for being on an open road or yeah. whatever, right? So the perverse answer to do humans need to influence the metrics is if you take classic econ and market theory 
You say no, the algorithm simply optimized for whatever metrics happen to drive the market. Right? If my market is shareholder value or my market is top line revenue, right? Whatever the market you're playing in is, whatever the rules of the market are, the algorithm's optimized for that. They don't care how. They'll figure out the open road solution because they'll just look at consumer behavior. Right. So the pessimistic view is Wally, -E, right? Well, sit around in chairs in space. Yeah. Two quick things. One, I want to introduce myself. I'm Professor Alva Taylor. I'm the faculty director of the Center for Digital Strategies, and so I want to welcome the, those of you who don't know me for first and second year, but welcome for coming. The second thing is we have some of our uh, fellows here, the second year fellows. Would you mind standing up so that people here can know who you are and they want to find out about the center? So these are our second year fellows. We're also starting a first year um, associate program, associates program uh, for people who are interested in digital and technology to be involved with the center to kind of understand these issues because some of the some of the, the kind of comical mistakes that, that people that, that uh, Omar was talking about today are the types of things that we, the lessons that we want you to have so when you're in your companies that not only do you not make those mistakes, but you can stop your company from making those mistakes and be the stars in your company. So, yeah, yeah, that. Yes. so thanks for coming everyone. Please uh, join me giving a big thank you. Thank you.